Well, it's known that ethnocultural minorities in Canada, both immigrant and native-born, experience unique hardships. These issues exist in the Filipino community as well as we have explored in our first two conversational segments. So what are the challenges you have faced in the past or are currently facing while adjusting to life in Canada or growing up between two cultures? And how do you think these challenges affected your mental health and sense of well-being? Oh, well, being bullied at school and everything is a norm. Right? Like, not a norm, but it happens all the time, right? But um, because I have been here since I was uh, like, gosh, 17 years old. At first, I experienced a little bit. I even lived in Hubima because my parents used to teach at the um, school there when I was uh, young, at a young age and living with Jasmine. But really, the thing that really bothers me is uh, a lot of these people are being so racist and stuff. Like, with my experience, I think a lot of those people that are natives are the most caring because I live there. I used to live there. So that's why when I see big people that are being racist, it really upsets me. I mean, gosh, my um, graduation partner when we went to, uh, when I went to my graduation was a native because we used to live there, right? So. I don't know. I've never had really experienced anything like that. And we even lived in Wichasquin for a few years. But maybe, or maybe because I didn't really care. Up to now, I don't give, I don't care what they do <laughs> as long as I do what I want kind of thing. So I've never really experienced, even in the, like the seniors sometimes, because we live in, um, we have our senior at the center over downtown, right? And sometimes there are people from the street that would come and use the bathroom and everything like that. Our, our guys that are manning the doors, they just let them in. And one time we didn't even know. I thought he was, she was part of our group. She just all of a sudden sat there and ate with us. And that was fine, like, you know. And then I got really upset because they said, you guys don't do your job. You don't know who's it. And they said, well, we thought that he's a guest of somebody. So, but, you know, it's, I've been here for so long. I've never, even my kids never had to experience any of that stuff. So I don't really know how to react to any of these things. All right, Tita, so uh, I know uh, in your seniors group also, you have a lot of seniors, you know, that uh, maybe uh, uh, your members being invited by their, um, their kids here and uh, maybe help in taking care of their apos, like their grandchildren. Yeah. Like, how are they, like, uh, doing? Like, are they, uh, are, are you seeing that they're contributing for their family and especially for the second and third generation? Well some of them that's why um, they can only go out on the weekend because uh, they are uh, five days a week um, babysitting I mean you know how uh, older people are you just say yes because you have to do it because it's um, it becomes like your obligation because uh, your kids are working and everything so you just agree to it right and doing it that's why uh coming to the center on sundays that's just their, their outing from babysitting but they are all fine like you know looking after the pool i know they grumble and uh, they uh, complain sometimes but that's very normal right and they live i mean they live with them and sometimes we have a few seniors that are in apartments now because uh, they could not uh, live with their kids like but 
other than that, they have their own thing. They do their own. Um, they try to amuse themselves, like go into the mall. They meet at the, the malls and stuff. So, so it, they're all, I think, adjusted to everything that's uh, here in Canada. There's about the 30 um, Filipinos that go to Northgate Mall before pandemic. Every day, Monday to Friday, there's uh, 30 of them that go there. They just uh, buy coffee and they just sit there till 12 o'clock. Then after that, then they run home because they have to pick up their kids. They grumble about it, but they're going to do it anyways, right? That's a normal. <laughs> yeah. And I think they're happy doing it too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, uh, Tita Lucy. So, yeah, that's uh, very interesting and uh, I've learned a lot actually from seniors because I also worked with the uh, seniors group before and even until right now. So yeah, so I think uh, um, from our panelists, uh, for uh, from what uh, April have asked us, so are there any you know challenges that you've been uh, that you face, especially uh, growing up in two cultures? Um, okay. Banjo, yeah, you, go. yeah, go ahead. Like the things that you're facing and the challenges you faced when again you were 13 when you got here um mm -hmm. and um trying to integrate yourself into a new culture and uh tell us about that and how it affected your mental health okay so um we first immigrated here back in 2000 or yeah 2000 right and our first city was winnipeg um so my first school there uh junior high i've been called a fob I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it means. So I just went like, okay. And then, yeah, I've been treated by, or if you know Winnipeg, there's a lot of Filipinos in Winnipeg, like concentrated wise, because it's such a small city. And um, yeah, I've been called a fob by Filipinos. So uh, six months later, my dad found a job here in Edmonton. So my, or we decided to move here in Edmonton. And then uh, my school here, um, there's not much Filipinos. I think there's like two of us, two Filipinos on that school. And most of the, uh, the students are like multicultural. I have like a black, Indian, Chinese, uh, white. It's like, like, it's like a melting pot of, um, cultures right and then uh, I kind of got along with them fine I didn't got called Bob I didn't I didn't get stereotype or anything so um, yeah growing up like I don't know why Filipinos down their own people instead of like lifting them up Thanks, Banjo. Uh, could you touch on also, you said that you had, you know, friends that were not from the Filipino community and your parents didn't want you hanging out with them? Oh, yeah. Uh, like back in junior high, right? Like uh, my friends were having um, a birthday party and I was invited and I asked my dad, like, can I go? He said, like, no. So I think he's scared of um, like, me hanging out with other cultures because he doesn't know that culture pretty well but i kind of felt sad because uh if i could have went to that party i could have like bonded with my uh classmates pretty well but we're still good friends like uh uh me and my um my classmates back then but then i could have had like a deeper connection with them if i if I could have hang out with them more instead of like just hanging or just seeing them in school. All right, uh, Ben, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, that was, you know, uh, good uh, you know, stories uh, from you. And thank you for sharing that. So um, maybe I could ask um, like uh, Adriel, because uh, he was born and raised here. And how is it like, you know, growing, uh, growing here and then, uh, you know, having 
I'm not so sure if you have that sense really of longing as being a Filipino. So can you share about that? So being born and raised here, uh, I was exposed to a lot of like the Western media, I guess you could say, like Sesame Street, Elmo, mm-hmm. Fast and Furious, Game of Thrones, you know. And then I also talked to friends who used English. I talked to them about pop culture, uh, North American pop culture specifically. I learned subjects in English. I learned the history of Canada. So I guess in summary, you could say that my Canadian side was more nurtured over time. Uh, From my Filipino side, I think my only exposure to it was the festivals and maybe those Filipino dramas you see on TV. But other than that, it wasn't really that much. I think personally, my struggle was trying to maintain a connection to to my Filipino side. I want to consider this work here part of my reconnection process. And uh, like a follow up question to that, uh, Adriel. Also, do you think it's you know uh, affected maybe uh, at some point uh, you know uh, on your life affected your mental health or maybe sense of well being? I'd say it affected more of my cultural identity mm-hmm. because I think this really came out when I go to the Philippines and visit my relatives over there. Mm-hmm. I feel like I don't really fit in there. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely a language barrier when I talk to my relatives. Mm -hmm. So you kind of felt alienated from them. Yeah, but thankfully they do speak a little bit of English, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you for that, for sharing, Adil. And uh, I want to go to, like, uh, maybe between Christina and Nicole, because you were... Uh, you came here like you're very, very young. Like I know, Christina, you've been here for like when you were three and Nicole, you're, uh, I think you're six. So maybe you can share how that, you know, our experience and how it affected, you know, your growing up. Uh, like, is there any challenges and if there's uh, it maybe it affected your well-being or mental health? So um, I guess I can start. Um, yeah, so I came here when I was four. Um, and I actually remember a lot from the Philippines and, you know, Tagalog was my first, my first language. Um, and we were very lucky that we had, like, my, a good chunk of my mom's family was already in Edmonton um, when we came here. Um, yeah, like, and we, I grew up in a very multicultural community too, like, no Woods is very, very multicultural. So when I started kindergarten, um, there were you know, a lot of visible minorities in that school. Um, there were no Filipinos, though. So I remember even the first sense I had of being different was, you know, when you had to do sh- uh, show and tell and um, mention your cousin's names. And my cousins had four, like, you know, names that weren't um, typically Western. So even at that moment, um, I became shy to even, even share. Um, and, and then I moved to another school when I was in grade one, so from grade one to six, um, I moved to another school in Nowas where it's also very multicultural. There were a lot of Latinos. One of my friends growing up was, you know, indigenous, um, learned a lot about indigenous culture. There were no Filipinos. So I remember, um, I think out of my whole grade, there were only three Asians, including myself. And people were always like, where are you from? Uh, and they automatically assume you're from China and you have to try and explain, uh, well, I don't even, like, at the time I was very young, right? So I didn't, I didn't even know where the Philippines was. And then they assumed the other two kids are from, um, China as well when they're from Brunei. Um, so yeah, so even though it's very multicultural, a lot of, uh, because it was mainly Indian, there's a lot of Latinos at the time too. Um, but yeah, you so you know, in a, in a way, I felt different, but at the same time, um, I didn't feel like, you know, that when I hear other experiences of kids who grew up in like all white schools, like I didn't necessarily have 
that experience. I do remember like when I was up to grade four or something, maybe I was like nine or so, I found myself accidentally just talking in Tagalog and I was like, okay, I gotta, you know, that's when I was like, I have to stop. So I think from then on, I had this fear of accidentally switching languages. So I just um, forced myself to keep speaking English. Um, and my parents also um, didn't really encourage to, for us to keep the language, unfortunately. Like I, I still understand it. I talked to my grandma in Tagalog and um, you know, I, I can read it, but you know, my cousins, most of my cousins here, like from, from when I was young up to now, were born in Canada, so they don't speak the language at all. Um, and so there's that disconnect, even with me and my sister. My sister came here when she was two. So we, we like, she had no memory, I at least had some memories. Um, but then you still feel a slight difference where, like, I've been always very interested in my culture and, and, and learning more. Um, while, you know, and I grew up with very multicultural friends, whereas, um, say, cousins here who were born here, they might have, you know, all their friends are Filipino because they went to a Catholic school where the majority were Filipino. But then you still feel some sense of separation because um, they never spoke um, the language and, um, you know, there's their interest in learning the culture is not the same as they mine, mine is. And then, you know, there's just differences. Like, um, a good example for my sister is, I think she was uh, in some ways more observant than me. Um, so in, in our elementary school, there's a custodian and he was, he was Filipino. Um, and I remember, I think she had a story, has a story where my dad came to the school one time and, you know, and then even like explaining what your dad does, because my dad was an engineer and, you know, I would, always, I would tell my friends, oh, my dad, my dad uh, works in a school. And they're like, oh, what does, what does he do? Is he a teacher? And it's like, no, he, he's a custodian. But in that sense, you feel um, some sense of embarrassment. I think my sister felt it way worse. So even the idea of like, is that our only, like, like when you see Filipino role models, we didn't see a lot. Like they were either nurses or, or for men, custodians. Um, and then also um, being in a very religious upbringing, like my mom was very religious. Uh, so having those um, arguments, especially starting in junior high, high school, and then when I went to university, now you're, you know, getting a liberal arts education and learning a lot more. There's a lot of these arguments about religion. So even like my sister and I just we stopped going to church because um, we just didn't connect with with that part of Filipino culture, which is so heavily, it's so, it's, it's the most, one of the most visible things, I would say the food um, and the, the religion, um, that's almost like in some way superficial too. And yes, uh, Tita Lucy is very interesting. You brought up um, growing up in Kadima um, because one of like one of my good friends is 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 Métis, and um, yeah, even though, uh, because I'm kind of culturally ambiguous, I've always had a lot of Indigenous people think that I'm Indigenous. I've had Filipino people question on on where I'm from or where whether I was actually born in the Philippines or whether my parents are fully Filipino. Um, but then when I meet Indigenous people, like my friend, and we, we immediately connected because um, there's parallels in those in those cultures. So even just in the last, I've always just been interested in the Indigenous part of the Philippines. I think that's something we're really missing from our, our you know, just our cultural identity. Um, there's a, like I feel, because it's like fragmented. Um, I find Filipinos tend to try to so hard to assimilate um, that they forget who they are and they don't um, they don't value passing their culture, their language to their children beyond the you know the religion and you know maybe food at parties. And yeah, I think I could go on and on about <laughs> about the subject here. Um, but yeah, those are just some ob observations. I think definitely um, just the divide between the between and because they try so hard just to assimilate, like um, 
I feel like Filipinos might not immediately say I'm facing racism. Like even for me, it's hard for me to say I face racism. Like it's interesting when I was young, I think I was in kindergarten, I was actually a black kid that did the Chinese eyes and did that to try to offend me, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess someone could say that's racist to me looking back as a kid being ignorant. Um, but yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, I feel like, especially uh, working with immigrants too, there's a lot of systemic barriers to, to job access, to getting credentials recognized. That sort of thing is very obvious. Like I saw it with my, with my dad. Um, and again, just seeing, seeing role models in the community. And even I argued with my parents on what I was going to take in university. Like, because my mom already had this idea I was going to be a nurse. My dad had this idea I was going to be an engineer. And I was like, no, I want to get into psychology or the arts. Um, so yeah, I think it was that generational divide um, for, the, for the main part that um, what it does influence mental health, but I also see it from working with immigrants, um, the stress of not finding work. I saw it, like I've seen it when I was working with Filipino families, um, I was surprised to see how much domestic violence there was too. Um, and I think that's also an issue that's not being addressed in the community as no. well. I, yeah. I even hear from um, a, fr a friend of mine who's Filipino, or sorry, Canadian born, Mm -hmm. So he um, has family um, who immigrated from the Philippines, I, I, it was like five or six years ago. Right. Um, and yeah, uh, like one, uh, his cousin has like mental health issues mm -hmm. and not um, their health needs. And yeah, there, there's, there's so many issues. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. And, and, and it's good thing you touch more on like uh, community issues and the, the cultural identity, which is also mentioned by other guests, uh, specifically Adriel, right? So I will, we'll, uh, we'll ask, uh, uh, that's actually a secret or our next question, but I just quickly uh, want to ask Mia before we move on. Like I know uh, you've been, uh, uh, you work before in uh, other country and then you move here. So how is that experience, you know, um, from other culture and then coming here and then, you know, doing all of these things? So is that affected all of those things like in your in your movement from other countries to the other? Um I I worked in Dubai for 3 years before I came here. Um I was a public relations uh, manager and uh definitely the culture there is very different from here. Even the weather from sandstorm to snowstorm. Hello. So I made some sacrifices uh just to come here because my mom said that um she couldn't drive. Um, her license was revoked due to DVT, uh, deep venous thrombosis. And she was stuck here in the house. Um, when I came here, I only found out that my brother took the equity of the house and bought another house in Vancouver. And so I was stuck with my sick mom with utang, debt, and uh, no career at all. But... Um, with grace of God, uh, everything went uh, to my favor. I um, I declared this property as a rental property. I did marketing, manual flyering in the uh, in front of King's University. This is where my house is located. I asked my uncle to build me three more rooms, cause the basement is like a poker room. It's like a socialization uh, area for the seniors. So I turned that into uh, rental uh, rooms. And so far, um, I only have two years left and everything is paid off. When I was in the Philippines and uh, in Dubai, I thought that Canada is like, you know, everything is good, everything is, you know, it's easy. But um, I never imagined myself climbing from, I was already there and then climbing again, like zero down. Cars wouldn't start, garage doors wouldn't open, and sometimes it would open in half. I don't have mano, I don't have mana. I got no not, no one to help me. I don't know how to ride the bus, and up to this day, I don't know how to ride the bus. So um, it was uh, pretty awful, but um, with the grace of God, I was able to um, to keep up, and um, I tried to learn through. 
the people that I meet around uh, the community. Um, I met Tita Lucy back in the days. I don't know if she still remember me because I gained a lot of weight. Back. Way back. <laughs> Way back, Tita. So, um, I did the uh, uh, six month stint for uh, Himig Pinoy, 11.7 World FM. I was a DJ back then. I also wrote some uh, some uh, articles for Alberta Filipino Journal. And from there, I met a lot of people. There's a lot of uh, Boholanos, Ilocanos, Patangueños. Uh, but there's um, but there's only limited for the youth, and uh, mainly that why we did the United Filipino Youth Council is to collaborate with Tayo Hoy, uh, uh, also with the Tito Oscar de la Paz. You know? Tito Oscar has been uh, he's been you know a good mentor too. Um, there's a lot of clash within the community. And I never expected that um, uh, the people that I trust the most would also stab me. That's you, you know I I listened to um, Panjo no Panjo. He didn't expect that his Filipino friends would bully him. No, because uh, Filipinos should look after one another. But um, I think that the, that this time of age. Uh, the millennials are very united. They're very excited to learn Fil- Tagalog. They're really excited to to collaborate, like what we're doing right now. But maybe back or uh, Tita Lucy's time, no? I'm not saying yeah. Tita Lucy, but you know what I mean. But mm-hmm. during time, there's like clash of I should be on top. What I what I always tell the the kids, it doesn't matter if you don't look good. Because they they try to be in front of camera, they try to speak Tagalog. It doesn't matter if you're short, you're tall, you're white, you're brown, you're black. It it doesn't matter what your physical appearance is. It doesn't matter if you don't have good grades in school. It doesn't matter if you're always on top. Um, the only lesson in school that is not being teach is you have to be a good person. Always be the good person, and that's what matters. And so these kids, um, they have like this um, um, insecurity. Um, there's one youth member that never spoke a single word at all. I met her a couple of times. She was 13 years old at that time. Never spoke a single word. She's so shy, naive, and so I learned that she was bullied in school. And so I told her that uh, you always have to be the good person, and you always have to know that if they can do it, yeah, you can. No matter what your color is, you can do better than anyone else. And now she's hosting uh, shows for us. Uh, she opened the uh, Jollibee in Edmonton and uh, is also a creative writer for Potato Corner and uh, she's also been uh, doing some artwork for the kids. Um, last June, June is a heritage month. I still have a copy of the declaration of the heritage month. It's very important because we push through this why. Among the communities, Koreans there are only 1,500 of them. And they have two cultural centers. Filipinos in Alberta, 175,000, not a single cultural center. Why? Because everyone wants to be that cultural on center. Top. They, want to be, they want to be on top of each other. And that doesn't help. Yep. It doesn't help at all. What will help the Filipino community, this generation, is that we become united. Collaboration means growth. It's it's always growth. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're Tayo, if you're Hoy, if you're UFYC. What really matters is that what is our goal? If Indians, Pakistans, and all this Chinese, they uh, uh, they they did all this kind of work, why can't we do the same? 
Philippine heritage is, is that the curriculum for Tagalog, for Filipino language, has been added already. Why don't we make the most out of it? Encourage your nephews, your nieces, your your grandchildren to learn to learn how to speak the Filipino language. Because why? First you have to first you have to teach them how to sing the national anthem. The national anthem has everything. Bayang Magiliw, Perlas Kanasinalangan. You know, it has all the history. One weird experience, Tita Lucy, and I would, I would like to share. I wore barong. I was invited in a, a town hall meeting with uh, Trudeau. And I was the only Filipino there. And I wore barong. And everyone was looking weirdly at me. Everyone was like, what is this made of and stuff. And I told them, back in Span Sp when we were conquered by Spaniards, only the Span Spanish people are allowed to, to wear the suit. No? Terno. But uh, barong, why barong? Because it's transparent. You would know that there's a weapon right behind you or are you going to attack someone or some? That's why Indios wear barong. And up to this day, uh, even the State of the Nation address in the Philippines, we wear barong. And ano ba yung nakakapangilabot? Like goosebumps. Maybe some, some, some of here doesn't know how to speak Tagalog. Whenever our flag is raised during Heritage Month, you feel the certain pride of being Filipino. And I hope that we just do the same thing for, for everyone else. Just try to write these songs and learn on YouTube. Lupang Hinirang and a song like Ang Bayan Ko. Bayan ko. I'll just sing a short, short thing, Tita Lucy. I hope you still recall this song. Ang bayan kong Pilipinas, lupa inang gintut bulaklak, pagibi. If you learn the exact, the exact translation for each word, then you would love to become 100% Filipino. Like talagang pinay na pinay. It runs in your blood. It runs in your culture. All you need to do is just pass it on. And if our generation would die here, like there's no, no one speaking in Tagalog or learning a culture, and we don't pass it on, then definitely the percentage would decrease and decrease. Maybe Tita Lucy's age, uh, time, 50%. Maybe Tita Christina, maybe 30%. At our, our time, 20%. But we got to boost it up. Because heritage was already a privilege given to us Filipinos. Um, with Nicole. I think our relationship with our cultural identity and our mental health, to me especially, it's a, it's, a, it's a significant one. If I didn't have my cultural identity, I don't know who I would be as a person. And that would affect how my thought processes would function, how my daily life would go through, right? So that's our mental health. And I think our relationship with our mental health starts at our childhood. So during childhood, I faced a lot of, I went to predominantly white schools. So there was always this internal monologue of, am I going to be white today or am I going to be Filipino today? It was a lot of, should I bring a sandwich or should I bring sinagan? Like, who should I be? That it's, it's hard to reconcile it within yourself um, at first, right? So it starts with these internalized racism and the impacts of colonialism that have been just within us for so long that has been passed from generation to generation that leads to the denial of culture, of our own personal culture when we have the ability to do so. That's affected my childhood a lot and my mental health and my personal cultural identity. Um, and it manifests in this sort of silence about what mental health is in the, in the community. Um, so I, I, I have gone through a lot of things. I faced depression in high school. I still currently do, not to the same extent, but I was so terrified of talking about these things to my parents, to anyone, because it felt like as soon as I admitted this, it would be a mark of my unsuccessfulness. And I think that's just a really integral part of being Filipino, right? We always, when we, when we leave the Philippines, 
to especially Canada or the States, anywhere, we, ex we expect success. We come here, we've sacrificed a lot of things because we want to be successful. And this is part of that. I think when we start talking about our mental health in the sense that like, we're not doing well, what is seen as normal, all of a sudden we're unsuccessful and we kind of start to deny even more our culture and our heritage because we can't relate to this version of success that has been normalized throughout the societal structures. Um, especially in this um, is again the crab mentality. You don't want people to see you sweat. But I think this, this failure is a natural part and it should be an integral part to leading us into our successfulness, right? Like we learn from our failure. And this is something that we never really discuss in Filipino communities, especially at home. Like I was always expected to have the highest marks and I would work for the highest marks. But if anything went wrong in this equation, immediately it would never work. You could never recover from it. So it's, it's hard to, to reconcile the Filipino community, like the Filipino culture, sorry, with the Western ideas of like, you can fail as long as you keep trying, you're okay. You know, like this kind of more, less conservative structure, less rigid. There was a lot more fluidity in um, school for me because it was predominantly white. So they had these structures wherein there's not as much competition to be the best. There's not as much um, expectation to always be perfect. I think that was the really, that was one part of my childhood that was, that took a toll on my mental health as long as well as the racism that I had to face so it was kind of like this it, it hit you twice the amount of denial you had for your culture right like you didn't want to succumb to this perfection of that your culture expected from you so you denied it there and then your peers the peers around me um, would always make fun of the culture even the parts that you loved about it dearly right so it was like you're not supposed to like it, you're not supposed to like it, but you do like some parts of it. And so the, the, reclam the reclamation of your identity fully, not just your Filipino identity, your Filipino culture, but also the culture that you're growing in, it's hard. Um, so I think that leads you to kind of isolate yourself because you think this is just happening to you because no one really talks about it in the Filipino community. Um, so to answer the first question, I think um, the, challenge, the challenges I face are just isolation because of racism and just the um, contradictory stances that Western culture and Filipino culture has. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. In our previous uh, discussion with Tita Ida uh, Lucila and uh, Tita Lucenia, we touched more about that. And that's why I'm going on, uh, moving forward to our next question, because uh, um, during that conversation, uh, Tita Ida mentioned that there are positive and negative um, traits and attitudes of uh, Filipinos have acquired through on the ongoing effects of colonialism. And I think uh, that was uh, mentioned, you know, a crowd mentality among Filipinos. And then the Tita Lucenia had also proposed a challenge to the Filipino community. And I think um, Mia has also give us a challenge as well and for the next generation to reinvent the Filipino identity, right? 